event service, can you tell me what's happened? When the 99 call comes in, it is only the start of what the patient has to go through. We have to make sure we get the right information for the patient to give the paramedics to make sure they get the right care. So when they hand it over to the hospital or wherever they're going to, they get the maximum help. I'm going to ask you some questions to make sure we get you the right help. I need to check if you lost any blood from anywhere. Because she'd had some palpitations in her chest, although she denied that there were palpitations, that's what she was describing. However, she'd also had a fall at some point last week, so although she hadn't rung for that, it ended up that is what we treated her for. She was in a lot of pain with her back. We did the ECG really to make sure that Carol wasn't having a heart attack, to make sure that her heart wasn't going too fast or too slow, and to make sure she, she didn't have anything more unusual on her ECG. It would have meant us going to a different hospital other than our local accident and emergency department. Empathy and compassion kind of run side by side with this job. You can't not have that as part of what you do. Some of the patients come on and they've been through really horrific things and all they've got to go on is your voice. So to be personable, articulate and knowledgeable, but being to a point where you can be compassionate is massively key. Sometimes it's a lot of the same people. You're building up like a little relationship with people. It's nice to think you're doing uh, good uh, for people. It really is vital, vital to people, you know. That's what this service is all about. But right, that we're going to be as quick as we can because it's not the warmest of us. They always are friendly, pleasant. I think it's part of the job. They're up, but you can always see you've been in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, a big welcome to all of you to the North East and your inspection of the North East Ambulance Service. Uh, my name is Yvonne Olmston and I'm a Chief Executive of the, uh, of the Trust. So I'd like to start by saying welcome to North East Ambulance Service and to our new journey for life. Why a new journey? Um, I think in historical terms we'll go back to January 2014 um, when CQC visited us um, on an unannounced visit and identified a number of compliance issues. There was then a period of significant change for the organisation with a number of key departures and um, I arrived as Chief Executive in October 2014. And what I could tell from the CQC visit really was that the issues that had been identified were indicators of much more deep-rooted issues um, that really identified um, trust-wide trust issues. But what I felt was very reassuring for me as a new incoming chief executive was that the staff are absolutely brilliant. Met a lot of staff, have been out on the road, done a lot of shifts, um, mm. spent a lot of time hanging around a &E units and um, the, the motivation and the compassion and the care among staff is absolutely brilliant and a hugely strong focus on caring for patients. So despite everything else, they still had retained that strong sense of care. And really all staff wanted was to change and wanted that improvement. Um, and so there was a willingness to change. And actually when I got out to talk with um, commissioning organisations, GPs and others, they really wanted to see the organisation become more successful. So that inspired the start of our new journey as an ambulance trust. Put that into context, there's a national direction around urgent and emergency care um, and you'd be well familiar with the themes around that. We set that against the demand picture that we've got of an increasingly complex patients, an ageing population, we're experiencing higher demand particularly with our 111 service and we're having to deal with significantly more urgent patients over the phone. Um, and in terms of PTS, we're undertaking a lot more same-day transport requests as hospitals increase uh, their turnover. So to try and summarise that in terms of what did that mean for organisational risks, well, starting with the workforce, the shortage of paramedics um, was putting a stress on other uh, elements of the organisation and um, there was clearly a need for cultural change and transformation. A finance, um, we had a deficit position at that time and significant financial pressures um, from the workforce issues, impacting on performance and impacting on quality and governance. So they were the risks that we're trying to manage as an organisation. So in some of the work that we embarked upon was around setting our new mission, vision and values and developing our strategy. It was really important to me that we use this exercise to really engage and involve the staff. 
Um, we've also done a lot of work around um, clarifying for the organisation and working through with staff what is our strategy. Um, so doing what we do well, looking after our staff, which is a, a really big theme for me, and um, finding new ways of working. And we've tried to work with staff to see how that translates into what that means for them in their particular role. And you'll see a number of posters around the organisation where we've taken examples of different roles and used that to translate into the strategy delivery. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Paul and I are now going to go into each domain to explain our current journey on what we're doing to um, improve and the improvements that we've already made. It's well known that across the NHS an engaged and competent workforce ends up in improved um, quality outcomes for patients. There's therefore been an intense focus over the last two years about improving the safe delivery of patient care. We've done that through um, improving an, the open and honest culture of staff. Um, we've also included an improvement around our clinical processes. Um, we've implemented um, clinical leadership closer to the front line with the introduction of our emergency care clinical managers. And we've also in, introduced a robust performance management framework. Our goal is to be a learning organisation and I think as we go through the slides you'll see the progress that we've made over the last two years um, in order to achieve that. We have had um, some cultural improvement which has been demonstrated in the staff survey. There's been an increase overall of 14% in incident reporting since last year. We've also improved processes and awareness around serious incidents against the new serious incident framework. Um, that was published earlier this uh, last year. Um, we've also introduced a robust root cause analysis process which is um, very much about engaging the frontline staff and making sure that they feel involved. We've also improved all of our safeguarding processes um, and staff are already reporting that there's a good awareness around safeguarding and that feels they, they feel that support is available as and when they need it. Medicines management is, uh, has also improved where we are averaging now and sustaining a 95% compliance against our CD audits. And again another non-compliance from our earlier inspection in 2014, we are now 100% compliant against um, our DBS requirements. So what's, there is more to do. Um, we are on the trajectory to make sure that we have safe staff and particularly in emergency care and are on track uh, to recruit paramedics to be at a full establishment by um, April 2017. Uh, we do have full staff in other areas which were also challenged earlier on um, last year, so that includes the emergency care contact centre but also our PTS services. We also um, have identified that we need to increase our safeguarding capacity within the safeguarding team and again we are pro uh, progressing with that. And there's still some more to do around our performance, around um, timescales, around our um, serious incidents. There are some challenges around our medicine storage, um, especially within the, the, the smaller stations. Um, however, we know that is a risk. We've risk assessed that. We haven't had any security breaches so far. Um, and we are addressing that by piloting the um, Omnicell um, electronic drugs management system, which is in a number of stations um, as we speak. Just to show you um, the trajectory of the incident reporting that we've seen, uh, the overall incidents um, have gone up quite considerably since 2010, um, particularly with that, uh, a big increase um, on patient safety incidents, um, as well as those um, overall reporting have gone up by 14%. But just to um, reiterate the fact that our positive report and culture is that of um, our no harm and minor um, increases here in the blue and the, and the green and that the major catastrophic and moderate are reducing year on year which is a positive report and culture. In relation to our staffing we have a ro robust workforce plan. Um, again I've said earlier that's to get us on trajectory within emergency care in particular to our current establishment by 2017. In order to do that, we've um, included some international recruitment where we've gone over to Poland. Um, we have a number of Polish paramedics who've recently started in the organisation. Um, we're fully staffed in the operations centre now and we are nearly up to establishment in recruitment to the clinical hub. Uh, we have an increase in students um, 
quite a significant increase in students, um, both from the degree programme but also uh, the foundation degree. And we've recently um, secured another foundation degree programme through Sunderland University, uh, which is going to be taking some um, students in taking this year in September. We've also introduced a paramedic bank um, for those paramedics who had left the organisation and were enticed away to go and work in, in other areas of um, the region. Um, we have maintained them on our paramedic bank um, in order to prevent, provide some resilience there. And we've also used our advanced technicians differently. They used to be paired up with a paramedic. We've now paired, that, paired those up with a healthcare assistant with support and um, supervision from the ECCMs. Um, in order to um, mitigate some of the skill mix that we had. We've also started I introducing some extra career, uh, some better career pathways um, around advanced practice. So we've got a number of advanced practitioners that we've um, recruited into the organisation, but also we've secured some funding through our health education um, partners in order to train another 37 um, in order to offer some career development for our frontline staff. Um, we've also started some pilot work in order to improve the work-life balance of our frontline crews um, to make sure that we retain staff um, and that's um, been looking specifically at late finishers and missed meal breaks which has proven to give some positive outcomes so far. So what are we doing around making sure that our services are effective? We are focusing on outcomes, the quality of life and making sure that we deliver our care based on best evidence. It's definitely a board priority for us. Um, we've had a restructure of the Clinical Care and Patient Safety Directorate, particularly around risk and regulatory services and complaints. We've introduced a system in order to improve our management and distribution of our policies. We've also introduced a Clinical Guidelines Handbook in 2014, which was very well received from the staff providing local information. Um, and we hope to get that in an electronic app for the staff app this year. As already mentioned, we've introduced the emergency care clinical managers, which provides some extra clinical supervision to our staff on the front line. And we've been very active in research um, over the years and have won many awards um, in that respect. And our clinical audit um, is growing and becoming more and more effective. The support tools we use are the emergency care clinical record. Um, we're also introducing, um, our managing a project now to introduce a new patient care record for um, this year, which is due to be rolled out in July. Um, but currently, staff can also access the GR Calc, any of the clinical guidelines um, on, from the Tough Book. We're also looking to roll out a new defibrillator this year to hopefully pick up on some of our areas where we're weaker in, the, in our um, clinical audit. Um, outcomes and again we've been involved in a lot of telehealth projects across the North East. We've also introduced a competency assessment framework for all levels of clinical staff on the front line. This goes from a band 2 up to a band 7 advanced practitioner and this is electronic and available on SharePoint. Um, staff initially self-assess themselves against that initially and then they, um, is that's backed up by their emergency care clinical managers assessment. Um, this is then collated and will actually feed back into the per, uh, personal development plans but also our training plan for next year. So overall, what impact has this had? The performance on our AQ AQIs has been uh, maintained and a lot of times we've been um, first nationally against other ambulance trusts, particularly in um, STEMI, PPCI, stroke, um, care bundles and arrival at the hyperacute stroke unit. There is more to do. Um, performance against our response targets. Um, Paul will go more into more, more into that um, in the responsive domain. Um, it's really important that we continuously get this con um, continuous improvement culture to make sure that we constantly improve on patient outcomes and that any learning from incidents, SIs or complaints is shared widely across the organisation and that staff feel really supported to actually report incidents and be involved in the root cause analysis and the outcomes of that. And we are working very effectively with cl clinical interfaces with other providers. Um, we are very active with the, both local, um, all of the local police forces um, and our mental health trusts on trying to improve the mental health path pathway currently.
Good afternoon. Um, I will be covering the responsive domain, um, predominantly related to um, delivery of our performance targets. Um, and to be able to do that, we have a relentless focus on the delivery of performance targets. We have predominantly been a, um, a top performer in, in respect of responding to our national performance targets, but we have seen a deterioration during uh, quarter three last year into quarter four um, this year. It's not unlike any other ambulance service nationally. It seems that uh, all ambulance services at this point are suffering with their national response time standards. What we've developed is, a, is an action plan. What we have seen is, a, is an increase in, in those calls. So we've put together internally with internal stakeholders from our operations centre to ensure that the actions that we are implementing reduce that red rate to what we believe uh, to a more appro appropriate level. We know as a trust which ultimately is, is consistent with our other ambulance services that our sickness absence is too high. This invariably puts a strain on our ability to to, to, to present full staffing on a, on a, on a shift by shift basis. So we've done a lot of work on improving the sickness absence policy. We, we peer assessed that policy with other ambulance services, reviewed it and agreed it internally with our staff side representatives. So hopefully the effects of managing sickness more robustly will see an increase in our staffing, staffing levels on a, on a daily basis. The same as other trusts are struggling with this, our hospital delays and our diverts, hospital delays, uh, delayed handovers, so we are being um, held up at two particular trusts within our operational area uh, where our handover of patients to clinical care is delayed, which invariably affects our ability to then respond into the community. I think a positive for us um, is certainly the call answer performance, the way in which we've been able to train our staff to answer both 999 and 111 calls means that we can use dual trained staff to flex between the, um, the ability to call, uh, call answer 111 or answer 999 calls wherever that activity exists, which that resilience allows us to move staff between both and achieve a call answer performance. We feel a big part of our plans is about the clinical hub and recruiting to a clinical hub. The clinical hub um, consistent of a number of clinicians where they can give help and advice to our call takers to ensure that um, the appropriateness of their categorization and making sure they help, help with decision making, but also from an um, ambulance dispatch perspective. So we, the clinicians can help to support and coach dispatch staff to make the, the appropriate decisions to ensure that the right resource is sent at the right time for, for patients. In respect of our uh, non-emergency, um, our non-emergency service, our PTS service, uh, patient transport service, um, what we have done, we, we're on a, a strategy of improvement for our patient transport service. We've moved from what was three distinct banding times through the day to an appointment time system. Um, this has been quite, quite a challenge, but we feel it, it, it reflects what patients want. What more is there to do? Um, well, we need to obviously see an improvement in our response time performance. It's absolutely key and we will work to ensure that our uh, action plans are fully implemented and we see that improvement uh, happening. I just want to go through a couple of graphs really that represent uh, some of the issues that, we're, that we've got, some of the challenges that we're facing around our, our, our operational performance. As you can see from this, from this graph, we have seen quite a, an increase in our, our one incidence, uh, brought about to some extent by the inclusion of what we had was peri-arrest situations which was, were nationally determined but this has given us a great challenge in respect of trying to achieve our, our standards, our eight minute standards to these patients.
This is a graph which, um, which displays that for our red two incidents, which again are, is a life-threatening category, um, one less to, to the R1 category, but, but this graph shows you where we've seen an increase in red volumes, um, which is the, the red line, when we've seen a, a consequence of that increase, as in a deterioration in our ability to, to perform uh, eight, in eight minutes, 75% of the time. And that's the, the blue dotted line that you see deteriorating down to 60%. Okay, in terms of the domain around caring, in terms of what we're doing, we're obviously putting a lot of effort into cultural improvement. And I think, again, from the Michael West research, there's a strong correlation between positive staff engagement, um, having a strong mission, vision and values, culture, and um, health outcomes and um, successful organisations. So it's really important that we work on cultural improvement. We're also building in um, a much bigger emphasis on use of patient feedback around our services. So how we're doing that, well, it's also really important that the board um, models leadership, has high visibility and models good behaviours. With the work we've done on the mission, vision and values, staff engagement, we signed up to investors and people and um, we're doing a lot of work around staff health and well-being and management leadership and development. In terms of what impact is that having, I think it was really heartening for all of us to see such a positive improvement in our staff survey. I think it was a bit earlier than we expected. And we've had great feedback around our friends and family um, performance and um, the debriefing system that we put in through the emergency care clinical managers, we're now able to audit that and um, an example of one of the actions we've put in place is that we're tackling violence and aggression against our staff working with Northumbria Police. Of course there's more to do, um, cultural change takes a long time so we have to continue the pace and um, scale of change around cultural improvement. We're going to work through the investors and people accreditation framework so we've done our baseline assessment and made our pledge. Um, we will be restructuring um, in organisational terms so that we can um, have a form following function. So we want an integrated care and transport service, we want an integrated um, care and transport structure. Um, so we will therefore be building up our management capability. Okay, and just a couple of slides that will um, illustrate those improvements. I think this one is uh, particularly um, heartening for us is to see that um, the number of staff who would not recommend um, the North East Ambulance Service as a place to work has decreased from uh, over 50% in April 2015 to um, just, uh, just over 30%, um, so quite a big percentage drop there. And similarly, we've had a big rise in the number of staff who would recommend um, NIAS as a place to work. And very positive um, friends and family test uh, scores around patient experience, as the graphs demonstrate there for PTS, um, the contact centre and emergency care, and a number of really nice patient quotes and th the feedback that we get. We get a lot of positive patient feedback, and I, I guess in terms of my experience, probably more so than I've experienced in other trusts, so that's a, a nice touch um, with the ambulance service. Okay, so the domain in terms of well-led, um, and our journey, what are we doing? We were really trying to try, drive change and improvement at pace. How are we doing that? With following the CQNC inspection in January 14, we had a full governance review. It was undertaken for us by Deloitte against the well-led framework um, from Monitor. Um, since then, we've had a review of our progress in implementing the recommendations. Um, we've recruited to a number of exec director and non-exec director posts, so we're still fairly embryonic in terms of our overall development as a um, unitary board. We've been undertaking a lot of cultural improvement work and um, working on improving communications given the difficulties within an organisation of this uh, nature. So what impact have we had? Um, well, the, in terms of the review of the Deloitte um, implementation of the recommendations, they came back and said that we had um, strengths in terms of our mission, vision and values, that we had developed a clear strategy. Um, our staff survey results had um, significantly improved, as uh, Joe's already explained. Um, that there was the, um, the, the beginnings of a culture around continuous improvement, that they could see that had significantly developed that we had increased staff engagement and there was an increased focus on risk management. 
In terms of communications, um, we have the summary that is published every week. Um, we have um, clarified the committee structure, developed a monthly board briefing and a staff app and are using crowdsources as one of the means of engaging staff in conversations with us. What more is there to do? Well, obviously, we've got to, still got a long way to go in terms of embedding and sustaining all of that. We have to accelerate the pace of change and we need to restructure to support our integrated care and transport. So by that I mean that we have separate um, divisional management around um, PTS, um, the 999 service and the operations centre. So we're looking at how do we integrate that to um, provide a more streamlined service to patients. So in summary, we have started our new journey. We're very much at the start of that. We are already starting to show some signs of improvement, which is really encouraging for us. So we can know where we are and we know where we want to be in the future. We want to aspire to be an outstanding organisation and that's our journey of improvement. I nominated Sheila Davies for an ABCD award because, from, in my opinion, she's an unsung hero. She manages the payroll for the trust. She's professional and she gets the job done, which helps me in turn do my job. I nominated Craig Foster for this award. He had two CPR calls, both involving babies, and Craig dealt with them exceptionally well. Uh, the babies that weren't breathing at the start of the calls were both breathing at the end of the call. I nominated Bernie Wells for the work that he's done with the end of life patients that we deal with. He's raised the profile of those patients and now they are dealt with on a similar vein as the emergency calls are. And my nomination for the Chairman's Award was Karen Gardner. Karen's challenge was to recruit the 50 emergency care clinical managers also to put together a programme of training and to deliver that. She's gone on since then to win a major award with the Ambulance Leadership Forum as well. Mm -hmm.